build muscle and stay fit and strong as you age. There's certainly a lot of controversy out there about how much protein you got to have, particularly if you get older. Well, on today's episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast, I'm going to talk all about this critical nutrient, how much of it you need, which proteins to eat and which to avoid, and what to do if you're a vegan, a vegetarian, or a high-performance athlete. So stick around because things are about to get a little controversial. Okay, first question that I get all the time, Dr. Gundry, how much protein do I need to eat? So the question of how much protein you need to eat is, uh, I think, fairly well settled by researchers in longevity like uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Walter Longo. And if you've noticed in my books, both The Plant Paradox and The Longevity Paradox, I use his formulas to calculate the amount of protein a normal, what's called a 70 kilogram man, 150 pound man, would usually need to eat. And it comes down, simply put, to probably about 20 to 30 grams of protein per day. Now, where do those figures come from? Well, one of the things that many nutritionists look at and forget is we actually recycle all of the protein that's in the lining of our gut wall. And we tend to shed most of our gut wall almost daily, at least every other day, all the cells lining our gut wall are kicked out and a new one replaces them. We don't waste those cells, so we actually eat those cells. Mucus that, you know, your runny nose, the mucus in the back of your throat are mucopolysaccharides. They're sugar molecules with protein, and we actually digest that mucus. So we actually have a continuous source of protein within us that can make up for a lot of the protein we assume we need on an everyday basis. So that's where these figures come from. Now, I think one of the most striking studies that was done, uh, published in 2009 in the Journal of the American Dietetic Association, there is a lot of controversy that as you get older, your protein needs may increase. And even uh, Dr. Longo, thinks that maybe after the age of 65 or 70, uh, you should perhaps add more protein to your diet. My personal feeling about that, which was refuted by this study, is that even if you're elderly, you don't need to consume more protein. So in this study, they took volunteers of two age groups, young adults and senior citizens, and they had them eat a meal of either 30 grams of lean ground beef, 90% lean ground beef, or a meal of 90 grams of lean ground beef. And then they actually looked at muscle synthesis, building of muscle, in other words, incorporating that protein into muscle. And what they found ought to shock everybody who thinks that protein is really, really important. The 30 grams of protein in that meat completely provided for muscle synthesis in both the young and the old. But the really startling thing was the 90 grams, either in the young or the old, did nothing more for protein synthesis. Now you have to ask, okay, what happened to the rest of that 60 grams of protein? Well, we don't waste energy, as I've talked about over and over again. We convert that protein, which we do not need to build muscle, we already met those needs with 30 grams, into sugar. It's called gluconeogenesis, look it up, it's done in your liver, and that sugar is converted into fat. So the idea in human studies that you need more than 30 grams a day to completely synthesize muscle is refuted by you know, human studies, even in older adults. So you know, 
30 grams actually is, is a lot of protein, and you can meet your total protein needs in, a, in this study with 30 grams. Dr. Walter Longo and I would like you to have a little less than that, maybe down to 20 grams, but we're talking about semantics here between 20 and 30. But the point is you can meet all your protein needs, muscle synthesis, with 30 grams a day. So you don't need you know, to eat a side of bison every day as some of the carnivore folks would have you believe. Okay, what happens if your body has too much protein? Well, there's really pretty good evidence that too much protein does not destroy your kidneys. Although, quite frankly, when I have people with chronic renal failure, the two things I really restrict is protein, and carbohydrates, particularly fruit carbohydrates, fructose. And there's some beautiful papers in the literature, please look them up, about how dangerous fructose is in aging and producing advanced glycation end products and as mitochondrial poisons. So the idea that to give fruit the boot is a really good idea. But Back to protein. One of the things I like to point out uh, to anyone who will bother to listen is a, a bear in hibernation. And a bear, a mother bear goes into hibernation pregnant. She gestates her young. She suckles her young. She spends about five months in the den. She doesn't eat during those five months. She leaves the den with all of her protein, all of her muscle mass intact. And the reason for that is if she used her muscles as a source of energy, she couldn't hunt. Now she leaves the den really skinny and I have some wonderful photographs of grizzly bears really skinny up in Canada uh, right after they came out of the den, but all her muscle is intact. So the point of all that is if you eat for instance, on a ketogenic diet, muscle protein should be really only about 10% of your calories. About 80% of your calories should be fat. And you'll spare your muscles. You will not go after your muscles as a source of energy. We're not that dumb. Our design is pretty doggone smart. So we're, we're over-proteinized in this country. Um, I think one of the best examples of a human being who transformed from a high fat diet to a high protein diet is the late Dr. Robert Atkins. Uh, I, I have the pleasure of actually taking care of Dr. Atkins, head nurse. I, I have the pleasure of knowing uh, Dr. Atkins' co-writer in all of, all of his books. And Dr. Atkins was a cardiologist. And Dr. Atkins, as most of us know, was famous as being the high fat doctor. And he got into so much trouble with the American Medical Association that he morphed into a high protein doctor because after all, you know, protein's good for you. And you can actually see, you can actually see pictures of him. And again, I have eyewitness accounts of him, that he went from actually a fairly thin person when he was a high fat doctor to progressively overweight. And when he died, and when he died, he was obese. And I think he's probably the perfect example of us on a high protein diet converting what protein excess that he was eating into sugar, which is then converted into fat. Now, you could mitigate this in a carnivore diet by, quite frankly, fasting. And so many of the people who describe a carn carnivore diet are actually combining a carnivore diet with fasting. But let me say this about the carnivore diet. One of the things that's missing from this discussion, and I think it's an incredibly important point, is there is this crazy sugar molecule called Nu5GC. 
and in my book I say, who knew, that is present in beef and lamb and pork, uh, which is the prevalent you know, things you eat on a carnivore diet. This sugar molecule does two really bad things. We don't have new 5GC. We have a very similar sugar molecule that lines our blood vessels, that lines our gut wall, called new 5AC. We share that with chicken and fish and shellfish. They have our sugar molecule. And there's a new study out recently that you probably saw it, that beef eaters had a much higher incidence of breast cancer than chicken eaters. And once again, the difference between those two sources of protein actually comes down to the fact that chicken has new 5AC and beef has new 5GC. And the evidence is overwhelming, sorry carnivore diets, that new 5GC promotes inflammation, promotes an autoimmune attack on our blood vessels, and promotes cancer cell growth. And also, interestingly enough, there's really good info that perhaps our species became a separate species from great apes because of this mutation. The other great apes actually make five new 5GC, like beef. Uh, and new 5GC damages your brain. It actually hurts neurons. And there's some really cool nerdy papers showing that one of the reasons we may have a bigger brain is because we mutated into a sugar molecule that doesn't bother neurons. So again, that's nerdy stuff. But the point of all this is there is no evidence of long-living people on a carnivore diet. Sorry, find one. I'll be happy to, to take it back. There is none. And the overwhelming evidence of the blue zones is the one thing they all share, and they all have different diets, is they have very, very little animal protein in their diets. Very little. It's the universal feature of these diets. So let's uh, please look up new 5GC and uh, you'll be shocked. I wish it wasn't true. Again, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska originally, uh, but it's there and it's an important thing to realize. So people want to know, okay, uh, how come so many people are getting such great results on the carnivore diet? And I said this on the podcast and I agree completely with it. A carnivore diet is, in a way, the ultimate elimination diet. And you have eliminated all sources of plant compounds that have the potential to be temporarily harmful to you. But again, an elimination diet is an elimination diet. It doesn't mean that this is a life-sustaining diet for the rest of your life. So I don't really have a problem with an elimination diet, but quite frankly, if I was going to do a carnivore diet, I would do a pescatarian diet where all I would eat is wild fish and shellfish for a limited amount of time. I certainly wouldn't do a beef or pork or lamb diet and expose myself to new 5GC. I mean, every study that's done on humans show that red meat, and no, pork is not the other white meat, red meat contributes to cancer and contributes to heart disease. And it's because it's not an evil thing, it's because it's got new 5GC instead of new 5AC. That's all. How do you know you're getting enough protein in your diet? Are there symptom signs that show up in your body if you're not getting enough? Well, again, that takes me back to the fact that it's incredibly rare in this country to not get enough protein in your diet. Uh, that's really one of the last things we see. Now, what I do see in my practice is there are a lot of elderly individuals who are not synthesizing protein in their liver properly. And that 
Albumin is 80% of all the protein in your body. It's the primary protein in your blood. Albumin is the white of egg whites, if you want to know what albumin looks like. And what I see in my practice in elderly individuals is they actually have low albumins, even, even though their total protein may be quite high. And what I've found in my practice is that this is actually because they've done so much damage to the lining of their gut wall that they don't have enough surface area to absorb vital nutrients like protein. And that's a really great point because so many of my patients who I put on my program, we've actually lowered the amount of protein they're eating per se, but we've taken away the gut damaging components of lectin containing foods. We take away their whole grain breads, their whole grain muffins, and we take away their cereals and their beans, and they actually regenerate their gut wall. Uh, again, think about this. Your, the surface of your gut wall is the same surface area as a tennis court. But if you constantly damage that surface by, by lectins, by antacids, by NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen, you limit the surface area, maybe down to the size of a ping pong table. And no wonder there is some evidence that you know, the older you get, the more protein you need because you don't have a surface area. But it's been really fascinating to me that actually limiting people's protein but taking away the gut harming products out of their diet restores their ability to have normal protein levels, even though I'm lowering the amount of protein they're eating. So I think that's a big missing clue to why this myth exists that the older you get, the more protein you need. One thing before we leave animal protein, and we're not gonna leave it for good, but animal protein, um, there are several amino acids that are more prevalent in animal protein than they are in plant protein that can stimulate a receptor of energy availability called mTOR, the mechanistic target of rapamycin, and subsequently increase insulin-like growth factor one, or IGF-1. Studies of super old individuals show that IGF-1 is extremely low in these people and is really a hallmark of successful aging. Since animal protein contains far more of the amino acids that this receptor of energy availability, mTOR, is looking for, it's exciting to see in my patients when we lessen animal protein in their diet, not necessarily remove it, their insulin-like growth factors plummet compared to when they were eating their normal diet. And this research has been, has been shown by researchers at Washington University in St. Louis, which I mention in all my books, where they took calorie-restricted individuals in, in the Calorie Restriction Society, changed them to a vegan calorie-restricted diet, and their already low insulin-like growth factors plummeted, again confirming in human trials how important the amino acids in animal protein are in turning on mTOR. Now, it is true in a pig study that the addition of the amino acid glycine to a pig diet negated the effect of what's called a methionine-rich diet. Methionine is one of the big drivers of mTOR. And uh, several of us in the longevity community will admit to taking several grams of glycine a day in the off chance that the pig study is right. And uh, so, have some glycine. Uh, it's actually uh, going to be appearing in one of my products soon. If you're going to eat animal protein, first of all, please, please, please try to limit your consumption 
of beef or lamb or pork to the occasional treat and make sure it's from grass-fed, grass-finished beef. There's a big difference between the label grass-fed and the label grass-fed and grass-finished because there is actually no government requirement to say what grass-fed is. And all cows, for at least one day of their lives, eat grass. So it's perfectly legal to say grass-fed beef and have that cow eat grass for one day and take it to the uh, feedlot and feed them grains and beans and still label it grass-fed. So look for grass finished. Find a farmer who does it. They are available. At Whole Foods, you'll, you'll look for the level five availability. And there's a lot of great online sources who will ship overnight. Um, I won't mention them here, but you'll, you write me and we can tell you where they are. The other option that was developed by Dr. Walter Longo, which I think is so important, He's shown that you can pretty much do what you want to do for 25 days a month and for five days straight during that month do a modified vegan fast where you eat somewhere between 600 and 800 calories, strictly vegan. And he has shown in humans that that will be the equivalent as if you were calorie restricted the entire month in terms of activating stem cells, in terms of lowering mTOR stimulation. And I think it's, it's a way of having your cake and eating it too. And you know, you're not going to eat cake, but I think it's a way of mitigating the suffering, if you will, of being calorie restricted the entire month. And if you want to restrict your calories every day, uh, knock your socks off, you're not going to be very happy and you're going to be pretty cold and skinny. The third thing that, that my wife Penny and I do is make a meat day a cheat day and do it if you want on a special occasion or do it every three months. For instance, you may see us at one of our favorite restaurants in Montecito that has a six ounce grass-fed, grass-finished filet. And you will see us actually order that about once every three months and split it. Now, the good news about that is uh, you'll both probably enjoy it and you both won't eat much of it. And the third thing is it will be far less expensive than if you each had it themselves. So it's a win-win and you know the waiters get disappointed because the bill's not very good. But this is a great way to you know, enjoy the occasional cheat. So I have, I have no problem with my patients or people who know me saying, I saw you eat a steak. And it's okay, yeah, I'll, I admit, I do it about once every three months, and it's a grass-fed, grass-finished steak. And usually Penny and I split it. So don't, don't deprive yourself, but again, the evidence is pretty doggone scary that beef and lamb and pork are not your long-term friends. All right, so enough about demonizing animal protein. So what kind of protein should you be eating? Now, first of all, you do not have to be a vegan or a vegetarian, but I personally take care of a large number of vegans and vegetarians. And as I've described before, usually during the week, uh, my wife and I eat a vegan diet from Monday through Friday. And then on the weekends, we tend to eat wild fish and wild shellfish. But you don't have to do that. There are great sources of plant proteins, concentrated plant proteins. One of my favorite is hemp protein. It's actually a great source of protein. Hemp, incidentally, has all the essential amino acids. Uh, Baruca nuts have one of the highest proteins of any nuts. 
In general, nuts have anywhere from four to six grams of protein, including all of the essential amino acids per a one ounce serving. So a one ounce is about a handful. So for instance, you could actually have say four handfuls of walnuts per day and pretty much come close to your total protein requirement for the day. Now, that's not including the protein that's going to be available in leaves or asparagus or, I mean, for instance, there's two grams of protein in almost every serving of vegetables that you could name. Mushrooms have some protein, but they're not extremely high in protein. You'd actually have to eat quite a few mushrooms every day to meet your protein requirements, but a trick with eating mushrooms is if you cook them, they're mostly water, so you can actually eat a whole lot more mushrooms if you cook them. And so mushrooms are another source of protein. There's great algae source of protein called spirulina. And flaxseed powder, flaxseed protein is another great source of protein. And don't forget there is hemp tofu. And please don't be afraid of getting your protein from lentils that have been pressure cooked. And for those of you who are still afraid of a pressure cooker, Eden brand beans pressure cook their lentils in the can. So it's perfectly safe to eat them. And by the way, why didn't I mention other beans? Well, beans are also great sources of proteins, but lentils have the most protein per bean, if you will, with very little carbohydrates. So it's my definite go-to choice. Plus, as you read in the longevity paradox, lentils are a rich source of this cool compound called polyamines, which actually turn on longevity genes. So there's fantastic sources. Now, there's been a lot of questions. We get, say, you say that gorillas and horses get all the protein they need by eating leaves and grass, and that's perfectly true. And there is some confusion that our digestive tract is different from that of a gorilla or even a horse. While it's true that our digestive tract is different than a gorilla, in fact, we have the exact same components as a gorilla or a horse. Now, we're totally different than the grazing animals like cows and sheep, which are ungulates. They have five different stomachs for the purpose of fermentation. So we're what's called a hind gut fermenter. That means most of the fermentation of plant products in humans takes place in the colon. On the other hand, gorillas are what are called mid-gut fermenters. Almost all the fermentation of plant products that they eat happens in their small intestine. And it's true that their small intestine is much larger than ours. We've actually shrunken our small intestine considerably. The ungulates, again to be nerdy, are foregut fermenters. They ferment in their five stomachs. So it's where plant material is fermented that differentiates us. But actually, we absorb about 20% of all the protein from our colon because that's where that fermentation takes place. So you don't have to be a gorilla and eat 15 pounds of leaves and twigs. That's not my point. The point is that all the largest animals on Earth are actually plant eaters, and they get all of their protein requirements met from the protein in plants. Now, do you have to eat a lot of plant material? Yes, you absolutely do. My wife and I, every night during the week, consume a mixing bowl of salad greens. It's a lot, and believe me, we never leave the table hungry. And so, I think that's a great solution. I'm full. I'm satisfied, I'm getting plenty of protein, and if I'm even worried that I'm not getting enough protein, 
I have several handfuls of nuts uh, at right before dinner. And if not, get your protein, for instance, like we do on the weekends from fish or shellfish. It's a great compromise. But you can get plenty of protein from plants if you know which plants to choose. All right, what should you do if you're an athlete or if you're trying to quickly build more muscle? I think the important thing is there are a large number of vegan and vegetarian athletes. And I think the impressive thing is that vegans can be athletes. And there are a number that I can mention. There are professional football players who are vegans. There are professional basketball players who are vegans. One of probably the most pro famous professional athletes, Tom Brady, pretty much follows the Plant Paradox program with a few exceptions. Uh, by the way, he just signed another two-year contract um, for a lot of money. And that's a pretty impressive guy who's aging very well, I might add, uh, without a huge amount of animal protein. So I think what I talked about at the beginning of the podcast is what we need to remember. In people who were challenged with a 30 gram animal protein load versus a 90 gram protein load, lo and behold, after 30 grams, there was no additional benefit of 60 grams of animal protein in building muscle. And I think you need to take that to the gym, take that to the bank, and realize that we have completely overestimated the need for huge amounts of protein in muscle synthesis. We just don't need it. And these are human studies, not animal studies. Okay, so that's it for our discussion of protein today. Uh, before I go, I've got a full list of Dr. Gundry approved animal products that we'll put in the show notes. So if you're curious about which meats are good and which you should avoid, check out the show notes for this episode on drgundry.com. All right, it's time for audience question. This week, we've got a great question from Dav Dav on YouTube, who asks, can prolonged fast negatively affect the microbiome, i.e. good bugs? That is a great question, and it's actually a two-part answer. So number one, I've talked about this before. Uh, I think Dr. Mercola and I talked about this on his podcast. You really, really, really got to be careful in this day and age about prolonged fast because during fasting, you will use your fat stores. And fat is where all of our heavy metals and all of our PCPs and organopesticides are stored basically safely. And when you do a prolonged fast, you release these into your circulation. And as Dr. Ray Walford from UCLA proved years ago in Biosphere 2, those heavy metals will not be excreted and will accumulate in your bloodstream for up to a year after your fast. So you've got to be really careful about how you accomplish this. We talked about this before. But getting back to the microbiome, it turns out that in terms of your microbiome, fasting may be one of the best things in the world you can do for your microbiome because it selects out a really cool bug called Acromancia mucinophilia, which can live on the mucus that lines your gut wall. And the more Acromancia mucinophilia you have, the more mucus it eats, but in a weird way, the more it stimulates your gut wall to make more mucus. And the more mucus you have, the better your long-term health, and the more protected you are against lectins and other bad bacteria when you begin to eat. So as strange as it may seem, Fasting is one of the best ways to preserve and stimulate probably the best bug in your gut, Acromancia mucinophilia. So that's actually why I do routine three-day fasts. Uh, plus, believe it or not, if, if I've got any pesticides or 
heavy metals in me after doing this for 20 years. Uh, I'm not worried about that anymore. But most people should be very worried about that. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Well, by now, you probably heard all about the keto diet. Maybe you've heard it can help you lose weight, feel sharper, and more. Or maybe you've read those articles saying that it's actually dangerous. Well, my guest today wants to help you sort out fact from fiction. And I couldn't have asked for a better guide. He's Mark Sisson founder of Primal Kitchen, former marathoner, best-selling author, and all-around impressive guy. And Mark is out with a brand new book called Keto for Life. And uh, it has my endorsement actually on the back of the book, and it's a great primer for anyone looking to try the keto diet. So on today's episode, Mark and I are gonna talk about weeding through decades of diet myths, some of our favorite subjects together, mm -hmm. the importance of adding fat to your diet, and whether long distance running is really good for you. So all of you runners, stay tuned, because we're gonna talk with one of the godfathers of running right here, Mark. Great to have you on Great the podcast. Great to see you again, Steve. The last time we saw each other was uh, Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. What a treat that was to come around the corner and see you and your wife. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. There we are. Uh, you know, you're going one way, I'm yep. going the other way, and we did a double take and yep. then stopped. You know, a couple feet apart, and we'd pass. Yeah, Art, Steve. Yeah, yep. yeah. there you go. So yeah, great to have you. So you and I have lived through the extremes of diet information, high carb, low fat, Atkins, and, and more. Um, in your case, what made you realize that you were doing everything wrong? Or maybe you never did anything wrong. You know, I didn't realize I was doing things wrong uh, for a long time. I was an uh, endurance athlete uh, starting out in the 70s, actually started in the 60s, but competed well in the 70s uh, in marathons got injured doing that. Um, as I find out later, it was a result, partly a result of the highly inflammatory diet that I was using to fuel all those miles. Uh, transitioned to triathlon and did Ironman a couple of times. And then I got the message that, uh, you know, I didn't want to beat myself up that much to be fit anymore. Uh, I had to retire from competition. Um, throughout my life as an athlete, I'd always sought ways in which I could enhance my performance naturally, legally. Uh, and that meant uh, some sort of dietary information or manipulation, supplements if that was the case. So I was always a student of, uh, of the human body, of, of human physiology, of evolution, of, um, as, as time went on, of gene expression and how uh, genetic science really factors into a lot of what we're talking about today. Uh, and I started uh, simply understanding that fats weren't necessarily the bad guy that they were made out to be in the 70s, 80s, and, and, and 90s. Uh, so I started incorporating more fats into my diet, and as I stopped training or, or you know, cut way back on my training, and I didn't need that many calories, I was adding in a little bit more of the fat. Um, I, I was always eating uh, protein. I started to look at, at um, you know, the amount of sugar I was eating, and, and I thought, well, this, uh, this isn't necessary anymore because I'm not running the miles, I'm not burning the calories, I'm not filling the glycogen stores and all of this. Uh, and so I started to cut back on the sugar, and I noticed I felt better uh, from that. And so I went for another decade uh, writing books about training and writing books about optimizing your diet for training, uh, starting to write books for the general public about how to lose weight by using dietary manipulation. Uh, however, I still suffered my own set of maladies. I still had uh, irritable bowel syndrome that ran my life. I had arthritis in my uh, feet. I had osteoarthritis in my feet that I thought was partly a result of my running career and partly just 
a natural artifact of being older, but I couldn't grip a golf club, and, and that was like weird to me. And uh, so I had the, the arthritis, I had tendonitis on a regular basis, I had all these itises, and, uh, and it just wasn't, it just was, that wasn't right for a guy who was trying to be not just fit, but now healthy. Uh, and when and I was, you're a world expert on health, and I'm a world expert on health, and that's the that was, and you see this a lot in our field. You see experts who still, you know, behind the curtain, they're suffering, and they're they've got all the maladies that they write about and talk about. So, in my case, when I was 47, my wife last year, yeah, really, it's going on 20 years ago, pal. <laughs> uh, when I was uh, 47, my wife said, "Look, you're writing about how how bad grain is for you." because uh, I'd done a lot of research on, on gluten and gliadin and zine and corn and, and all of the other, um, you know, these anti-nutrients, these fold, tightly folded proteins. Um, and she said, you're writing about all this grain stuff. You still have grain in your diet. What's that about? And I'm like, well, I'm defending my right to eat grain because I don't think that's the cause of anything that's going on with me. She said, well, why don't you give up grain for 30 days? Well, I gave up grain for 30 days, and it absolutely transformed my life. It was the most amazing transformation. The arthritis in my feet went away. The irritable, bowel, the irritable bowel syndrome that, again, was like running my life since the age of 14 went away. The GERD that I experienced, uh, uh, you know, weird places like sitting back in an in a, in a airplane seat or something like that in the wrong position, that went away. Um, I had hemorrhoids for a long, uh, much of my life, went away. Uh, you know, the sinus infections that would linger after a cold, the stuffed up head that would just wouldn't seem to, that went away. It was like, it was incredible, this transformation from having given up this one food group that, that I was told my whole life was an important part of a the healthy, cornerstone. The cornerstone of a healthy diet, six to 11 servings a day. Well, that was such an aha moment for me that I really shifted everything to looking at, um, okay, how, if, if, if I'm a guy who defended my right to eat grains, in the face of all this evidence, how many millions, tens of millions of people are out there suffering the same sorts of things I am? They may not be celiac, they may not be, you know, gluten intolerant on a, on a certain tests, but there's something about their cons consumption of grains that's probably interfering with their, uh, their enjoyment of life to the fullest extent. That became the impetus for my looking into uh, the evolution of the human diet and how our genes you know, uh, turn on or off in response to certain inputs that we give them. Um, many of these inputs have to do with food and the foods that we choose to consume. Uh, and it really kind of opened this amazing world of, of exploration that continues to this day. So initially, I started with creating the primal blueprint, and that was yep. sort of based on our ancestral patterns of not just how we ate, you know, plants and animals, uh, but avoiding toxic foods. Um, you know, moving around a lot at a low level of activity, not marathon running or triathlons, lifting heavy things once in a while, sprinting once in a while, getting plenty of sleep, uh, using our brain, engaging in play, all these things that I felt were sort of universal uh, behaviors that we all not only would like to exhibit, but our, our genes expect of us. And if we don't give those inputs to our genes, our genes don't manifest. They don't rebuild, renew, regenerate, recreate us the way we'd like to be, to be rebuilt. So uh, started out with Primal, and that was when Paleo was getting on. I just Primal yeah. was my own brand, and I got so dialed in with that, and I got so happy with my results, and I got and I had hundreds of thousands, millions of people who were following my blog and 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 reporting back about their incredible experiences. I thought, well, I could leave it at that, but you know, I'm th maybe there's more, and that's when I started looking at uh, a ketogenic diet as what I would call next level stuff. You know, that's, that was what got me ultimately to experimenting with, um, now, which is the basis for Keto for Life, uh, developing what I call metabolic flexibility. So you can live your life without ever having to think about counting calories or portion control or meal time or any of that other stuff. I'm gonna stop you and uh, I'm gonna point out that why is it that your wife and my wife uh, are usually so intelligent and that if we would just listen to them, uh, like you have, and yeah. I, I certainly have, yeah. it's amazing. No, it is. Kicking and screaming, by the way. I, lift, I listened to her kicking and screaming, but it was quite the eye-opener, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, so I, I had to give a shout out to, sure. to wives, because yeah. uh, uh, everything good that happens, happens because of my wife. Yeah. Yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, all right, so yeah, I mean, you really, and I 
called you a, a grandfather of the keto movement, but you know, Mark Daly Apple and you know, the Primal Blueprint really you know, kind of set the stage for yes. a lot of what you know, we now do in the ancestral movement mm -hmm. or paleo movement. So a lot of people are confused by all these names. Um, what, what's the difference between a paleo primal diet mm -hmm. and, and a keto primal diet? Right. So it's a, it's a, it becomes nuanced at this point. It's really um, all of these diets that, that tend to work mostly work because of the things you're not eating. Yeah. Okay, so when you eliminate the offending foods, when you eliminate um, the sugars, the sugary drinks, the pies, cakes, candies, cookies, sorry people, the, um, the breads, the pastas, the cereals, and you come down to this list of natural, real food, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruit, some, some starchy tubers, that's real food. That's what the body is, is equipped to handle. So paleo really looked at um, that cornucopia of foods as uh, basically as much as you want, as often as you want, because you're not eating the toxic frankenfoods that, that society has created for us. Um, Primal kind of looked at that and said, well, maybe there's some things that we can add. Uh, because paleo tended to, to think in terms of like dairy being off limits because until we started herding animals 10,000 years ago, our ancestors di didn't consume dairy. Um, we could go into a whole discussion about why I think dairy is appropriate under certain circumstances. But all these foods exist on the spectrum too. I mean, any food that you talk about, I can, I can give you exceptionally great versions of those foods and horribly toxic versions of those foods. So when we talk about dairy, for instance, you know, 2% skim homogenized pasteurized Forget it, it's nasty stuff. Um, it's uh, A1 casein, which is a completely different casein from uh, which most of us uh, evolved to uh, digest easily. Uh, on the other hand, you've got, a, you've got ghee and butter and, and, and artisanal cheeses, and I think they're great. Uh, raw milk, uh, if you can get it, um, for some people, it's, it's great. So dairy became one of those little touch points where paleo said we're not going to do dairy and I said primal I said look if you're not lactose intolerant then I think dairy's fine um, a little bit of chocolate once in a while a little bit of red wine I mean I wanted to be as inclusive as possible with the primal blueprint I want to create a, a list of foods that people didn't feel like they were giving up they were that they were sacrificing in large quantities all the foods all the comfort foods that they'd they'd eaten over time now as paleo and then primal sort of became more mainstream, we start talking about keto and what is keto? Keto, uh, the ketogenic diet, uh, and it's, it's a little bit of an elaborate discussion here, but um, the body runs on uh, fats and, and, and carbohydrates mostly. And uh, the three macronutrients that we talk about are fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Well, proteins are largely structural, so we want to consume protein just to rebuild our bodies. But fats and carbohydrates have been sort of the fuel that we've used. Um, we were born with this amazing default setting that would allow us to derive most of our energy from fat, from stored body fat. Um, in the absence of food or fuel, historically over millions of years, which was generally the case for most people, you didn't have three square meals a day, you'd go, you'd miss meals, you'd miss days, you'd go days without eating and you had to maintain energy and you had to maintain muscle mass. The body evolved in an incredible system to take some of the stored body fat, combust that as fuel in the muscles, take other parts of that fat, send it to the liver, and make another fuel that we call ketones. Most people don't even know about the existence of ketones, but ketones are, as I say, we're, we're born with this amazing ability to create these ketones. Um, the liver, under the right circumstances, the liver can make 750 calories a day worth of this fuel, worth of ketones. So the idea behind the ketogenic diet was uh, let's get away from this dependency on carbohydrates. Let's get away from this having to eat carbohydrates every couple of hours and have our blood sugar go up because the carbs convert to glucose and that causes insulin and then an insulin takes the glucose out of the bloodstream because it wants to get rid of it and our blood sugar drops and we get hungry again and we have to eat more carbs and you go on this roller coaster all day long. And I, when I say all day long, I'm talking for decades. Most people start with the first meal their parent, the first solid food their parents give them is carbohydrate based. So we, we, we lose this ability to burn fat, we lose this ability to, uh, to make ketones and use ketones efficiently, we become carbohydrate dependent for most of our lives. 
So the ketogenic diet and, and, and what we call keto in general is a way of training your body to get back to this, this um, flexibility, this metabolic flexibility where the body can extract energy not just from carbohydrates, which most people do, but from fat on your plate of food, the fat on your hips and thighs and belly, the carbohydrate on your plate of food, the glucose in your bloodstream, the glycogen in your muscles, the ketones that your liver's making, and you become metabolically flexible to the extent that you don't, uh, you, you don't really ever run out of energy because you always have an energy source. Your body knows how to take, if there's no food immediately available, the body just goes, hmm, I think I'll take it off my thighs and combust it in the muscles. I'll send some to the liver. I'll send the ketones that are made there to fuel the brain. We won't need carbohydrates. We'll go as long as you want. A couple meals, a couple days. We don't care. We got this handled. So the body, we train the body to become metabolically flexible this way. The other thing, and I think the most uh, important aspect of this, is that hunger, appetite, and cravings dissipate or go away in many, in many cases. So where most people who are carbohydrate dependent are living one meal to the next, like, okay, we just had breakfast, what time's lunch? And uh, we get better back, have a snack before lunch. <laughs> Gotta have a snack, a mid-morning, a coffee break in the morning, you know, or a pick-me-up because I'm gonna feel like taking a nap at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon if I don't have a, a bagel or an energy bar, that's the latest one, you know, and then go home and have dinner and, and then maybe have a snack watching TV. This is um, not only uh, antithetical to health, uh, it's also a pattern that, that the like most people in this country engage in. We eat just way too much food. And the problem is, it's driven by hunger. It, you know, people actually feel hunger because it's a hormonal dysregulation that they're causing by their choices of food. And so if I can you know, it, it, uh, educate and instruct people on other choices of food that would have a different effect and would, and would cause their bodies to to upregulate enzyme systems that take fat out of storage and combust it, that would upregulate enzyme systems that um, help in the conversion uh, of uh, other fats into ketones to use as fuel, that would uh, improve what we call mitochondrial biogenesis, actually increase the number of power plants in the cell where the fat burns, improve the efficiency of those power plants, of those mitochondria. Uh, you literally repattern, reprogram your body to become fat adapted and keto adapted. Uh, and it is such a sense of freedom for everybody who does this. Wow. So how does somebody sign up for this? <laughs> you sign up. Um, they, you go to the store and yeah, you buy uh, yeah, well, Primal Kitchen Mayo. Well, that's... So, well, I'm doing this yeah, for a purpose. Yeah. Um, this is fat. Yes. This is, I mean... 100% fat. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, it's basically yeah. fat. Yeah. And you're telling me that one of the ways to get this... Yes. ...is you should eat fat. Yes. But fat makes you fat. Come on, Mark. Look, um, look, at, look at you, you, God you bless, slob. God <laughs> bless Susan Powder. Remember her? Yeah, I do. Fat <laughs> makes you fat. I'm like, all right. Um, I bought into that, too, by yeah. the way. And I know oh, you yeah. did as well. I did. It made sense, right? It made sense. Um, fat doesn't make you fat, and, and in fact, uh, in order to burn fat, you have to provide some, typically some form of fat to um, uh, stoke the fire. Uh, so it's really the absence of carbohydrate that prompts the body to go into this ketogenic state. This, and by ketogenic, we mean the genesis of ketones. We're making ketones. Um, because typically, we don't make ketones if we're living on a carbohydrate-based carb dependency uh, state most of the time, there's no need to. The body says, I got plenty of fuel. Uh, I've got this uh, glucose in the bloodstream. You're I know you're going to eat every two hours. That's cool. Uh, or even every four hours. Um, you know, the, the, the brain is happy with the glucose. Um, insulin, which is higher because of all the carbohydrates you eat, insulin locks fat into the fat cells. So you can't combust that fat. So yep. you, you just become, uh, you, and over time, excess calories then get converted to stored body fat which historically is awesome. Imagine, you know, two, a million years ago or 500,000 years ago, whatever, you come across some food and you go, okay, I finally find some food after a couple of days. And you don't just eat till, you know, you're done. You keep eating. Your brain is wired to overeat that food. And we evolved a system, and it's so elegant, a system that takes the extra calories from that food that we overate and converts them into energy that we, instead of carrying five gallon buckets around with us all through the woods and everything, 
We store this on our hips, on our butt, on our thighs, right around the center of gravity so that we can carry it with us and have access to the fuel whenever we run out of fuel. It's a beautiful system. It's a beautiful system as long as you also have the ability to take that fuel out of storage and burn it. And that's what most people have lost. So in order to, in order to get there, you have to withhold carbohydrates. You have to say, okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut back on my intake of sugars and sweets and sweetened beverages and pies, cakes, candies, cookies. And, and this doesn't mean you have to, like, vegetables are basically free on, on a keto diet. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice. I tell people when you start keto, do not let yourself go hungry. The first three weeks, you're just gonna train your body to burn fat. I don't care what happens. I don't care if you don't lose weight. I can pretty much guarantee you won't gain weight, but I don't care if you don't lose weight that first three weeks. I want your body to adapt to this knowledge that there are not gonna be that many carbohydrates available. It's gonna be um, a, a different uh, situation uh, in terms of the environment. And, and as a result, and it doesn't happen in a day or a meal or a day or whatever, but over a couple of days, a couple of weeks, the body says, oh, that's what's going on. So I'm gonna upregulate. Um, I'm gonna start building more of these mitochondria. Um, I'm going to, the brain starts to understand how to use ketones better and more efficiently. The liver starts pumping ketones out um, and everything's running quite smoothly. And at that point, about three weeks in, when I say you're fat and keto adapted, and that's three weeks of having restricted carbs to say 50 or fewer grams a day. We could talk about what that looks like. And you're basically there. And, and from, from that point on, it's really how, how closely can you adhere to a program that's within reason. I'm not saying you have to eat 50 grams of carbs the rest of your life. In fact, what I strive for with metabolic flexibility is what I call the keto zone. Once you've done the work, once you've built the metabolic machinery, once you've become metabolically flexible, then I can have a day where I eat nothing, feel fine. I can have a day where I eat a lunch and a dinner, feel fine. I can have a day where I eat 175 or 200 grams of carbs and feel fine. What's the difference? There's no difference. I feel fine. That's all that matters. All that matters is I'm able to go about my life without any conscious knowledge that, oh my God, I screwed things up because I was supposed to be keto and then I wasn't and I felt like crap. If you feel like crap after that, you're not keto adapted. So uh, give me an idea. Most Americans are not keto adapted. They don't have metabolic flexibility. Right. They can't turn from sugar burning to fat burning. And people hear about the, um, the keto flu or the Adkins flu. How do you get people through that transition phase? So there are a number of um, ways to do that. Uh, in my uh, previous book, uh, The Keto Reset Diet, yep. um, we talked about a six-week um, induction phase, if you will, six weeks of transitioning, stair-stepping to um, mostly a primal, uh, primal blueprint type diet, which is just basically cutting out breads and pastas and cereals. But, but you could still have starchy tubers, you could still have um, uh, you know, peas and beans and, and, and things like that that were natural, um, but would still keep you at around 100, 120 grams of carbs a day. And that just gets your body used to having fewer carbs. Most people eat three, four, five hundred grams of carbs a day. No, come on. I'm telling you, you know, you absolutely <laughs> know that. Um, it's, it's, it's scary how much uh, the, the world depends on carbohydrate. So when you, um, but if you eliminate all the toxic foods and you come down to this list of, of um, you know, healthful foods that are all natural, that are on the perimeter of, of you know, the, the store, you can pretty much eat what you want. So my first rule of thumb, as I say, don't let yourself go hungry. This is not about you struggling and suffering to get to a certain point. This is about you with grace and ease transitioning your body to a point where it's, first of all, okay with not eating a lot of sugar and not eating every couple of hours. And then once you get to that point, then all you gotta do is find 50 or 60 grams of carbs per day that you cut from that. And then the transition becomes quite easy. Then it's, there's, there's really no keto flu. A lot of people who, who claim to get a keto flu, and this is a, this is a sense of like a little bit of malaise, a little bit of dizziness, a little bit of, of uh, lightheadedness, because the brain hasn't yet gotten used to the lowered glucose and hasn't really gotten the message that it's fine to be burning ketones all the time. Uh, the brain actually thrives more on ketones than it does uh, on glucose. Um, but that transition takes a while. A any of these 
uh, things that we do to the human body. Uh, you know, e evolution created a, this amazing system, as I said, and one of the aspects of the system is, it, is that it, it, it likes the status quo until you prove to it that the status quo is no longer going to be. So if, if you do thing, a meal one, for one meal or two meals, the body goes, nah, I'm resisting that because that's not enough time for me to even think about changing. Because if I'm going to use resources, if this body's going to use resources to build more enzyme systems, to make more mitochondria, um, to increase bone density, to increase muscle, those all are expensive uh, resource using things, you got you to figure out how to trick the body into doing that by giving the genetic signals that cause genes that, to turn on that, that build muscle, to cause the genes that turn on that make mitochondria, or that make uh, bones stronger, or that uh, support the immune system. All of these are well within our control as humans based largely on choices we make with the foods that we choose to eat, how much sleep we get, how well we control stress, the types of exercise we choose to do. You know, you choose to do one type of exercise, you become long and skinny and, and gaunt. You, tr you choose to do another type of exercise, you become, you know, larger and, and more muscular and, and, and stronger. So um, my, my life's work has been really about identifying these hidden genetic switches that we all have and, and exposing them to people and saying, here's, here's something you might try if this is your goal. Cool. You mentioned this already, but I want to get back to this. Should you, your book is Keto for Life. Should I always be in ketosis? So that's kind of a <laughs> bait and switch, I guess, um, because, um, well, it, it, and it's also, you've worked with publishers, and so you come up with a, <laughs> well, you come up with a title, and, and you like your title, and they like yours, and you wind up putting them together. This is, this is a longevity book, so this is, yeah. this, is, uh, this is a book about how to live a longer, happier, healthier, more productive, loving life. Uh, and so Keto for Life was, and because Keto was my last book, they needed the transition, it's, it's great. Um, but what, what I'm talking about, and when I talk about keto, and here's a good, a, a good segue to make that distinction. So keto is a way of, of eating, a way of living, that embodies this low carb um, methodology. But it doesn't just require or involve or necessitate low carb. You can go keto just by not eating. So if you, uh, if you don't eat for three days, um, you're in ketosis. Uh, you prompt the body to, to create these ketones. Now it's a lot easier if you don't eat th for three days, if you become keto adapted. If you are a sugar burner and you don't eat for three days, you know, that's where you have the visions. That's where you see Elvis and Jesus, and I mean, you see the whole, the whole thing, right? So, <laughs> and the crash and burn. <laughs> the crash and burn, that's the crash and burn. So uh, to ease your way into this, this keto way of, of eating has as much to do with um, how often you eat, uh, the choices that you make when you eat, um, the fractal nature of eating. So as I talk a lot about uh, in, in the book, and, I, and I've talked a lot on podcasts, I don't know if you know a guy named Art Devaney. Oh yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so Art, you know, he's always been ahead of the curve on everything. And, and one of the things he started 10 years ago was this, he just says, I eat fractally. Some days I eat a meal, some days I don't eat, some days I eat three meals, some days a big meal and a small meal. And, and he changes it up because that's the human experience. Historically, humans didn't have three portion-controlled meals a day plus two snacks, you know, plus a, a bedtime uh, pick-me-up or whatever. So um, Keto for Life is really about adopting this way, this, this keto eating strategy that allows you to maintain metabolic flexibility whether you go off keto for a couple of days and say, I'm going to have, uh, you know, I'm going on vacation, I'm going to have pasta you know, and I'll suffer the consequences. Um, but, uh, um, like, I, I went to, you know, I moved to Miami, and, and um, my wife and I found this restaurant, and, um, you know, I hadn't had pasta for, seriously, for 15 years. And, and we found a pasta dish that's got this amazing, you know, truffle Alfredo sauce, Ooh, and it was yeah. gluten-free pasta. And we like, you know, so once a week, we would go there and order salmon and, and the pasta and split both, and, and that would be our meal. Look, I love... To eat. I love food. I want every bite of food I put in my mouth to taste great. So I've, I'm not advocating for sacrifice and discipline. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm advocating for mindful eating and ultimately arriving at a place where you are so intuitively tuned into your own body that you don't need to think about it. You will go, you know, I'm, I could eat the whole cheesecake, but 
you know, that, I know that's not going to serve me, so I'll have a bite. That'll serve me. Um, you know, I, I, can, uh, I can go without eating this next meal uh, because I don't have time to eat and I've got th some things to do, and I'm confident that my body will have zero negative consequences from that. And I won't be hangry, and I won't think about not eating. I'll just, it's such, as I say, it's such a, um, uh, a level of freedom that most people never get to experience. When you think about how much of your life is tied to eating and regular meal times and being hungry and feeding the hunger, um, in most, most cases, unnecessarily, like you're not really hungry. You're just like, your mouth is watering because it's 12.30 and it's lunchtime. That's, you know, you bring up a, a good point. So many people become hangry yeah. when they start a diet. Yeah. Um, that's the low blood sugar. Yeah. So that's not having become fat adapted yet. And that's why diets don't work if you just count calories. If you're, if you're just saying, well, I'm going to, this keto sounds good, but I don't think I could go without eating carbs. I think I'll just count calories. Um, the discipline works as long as it does, and then it stops. And, and most people who are uh, carb-centric eaters who start to cut back on all their calories, um, they get hungry, they get hangry. Uh, now they're fighting it the whole way. Um, typically, uh, they have this um, entirely different physiology that when they don't eat, instead of the body just going, hey, I got this, I'm gonna burn fat, I'm gonna make ketones, it's all gonna be great, love what you're doing. Um, the body goes, wait a minute, I'm used to carbohydrates, what's going on? The brain starts to get panicky, sends signals to the liver, the, I mean to the um, adrenals. The adrenals secrete cortisol. Cortisol then goes out and, and literally tears down muscle tissue to find a couple of amino acids it can send to the liver to become glucose. And it becomes a very destructive process. And that's the experience that most people had dieting in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And when you used to watch The Biggest Loser, well, I don't, you didn't watch it, but... Um, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you see these people lose 200 pounds in a season, 150, 160, 200 pounds. Then you hear about them three years later, they're back to where they were before and, and, and bigger. Worse. And yeah. bigger. Yeah. Because they, they lost muscle mass and uh, their metabolisms got all screwed up and now it took fewer calories to, to fill them and yet they still had the hunger thing. And it's horrible. So. The, the, the keto lifestyle really sort of fixes all that and, and does so without necessitating that you be ketogenic your whole, your whole life. You know, the term ketosis is an interesting term because osis means an excess of something. Mm -hmm. So ketosis basically means you have an excess of ketones in the bloodstream. Well, when you first start eating this way, the liver's like, I can do this, and the liver starts pumping out ketones and because you haven't built the metabolic machinery to burn them, uh, you, you, you can take a blood test and you go, oh my gosh, I'm four millimolar, I'm six millimolar. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in ketosis. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me that you're in ketosis. I mean, that's, you're making ketones, but if you're not using them, you're not, get, you're not getting the benefits of this lifestyle. So you have to build a metabolic machinery and there's, t it, takes, it, it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of, there's an area where you, you have to be disciplined about it. Um, but, and there's certain workouts that you can do that will enhance the effect uh, uh, more quickly. But there's a point at which uh, you become uh, so keto adapted that the liver, which started out going frantically pumping out ketones, um, and you'd pee them out and that's why you show purple on these pee strips and you'd yeah. breathe them out and that's why your friends would stay away. And um, now the liver's going, um, see, I know what you're doing here. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna fool me. I want to save. I want to conserve energy because that's a human. That's a human experience. It's, is to not use resources, waste resources, um, and and the body recognizes that once you get keto adapted and fat adapted, um, most of the work you do throughout the day can be fueled by fat. So your muscles are now they're not burning glycogen and not, a little bit, but they're not. Yeah. They're mostly burning fat, and you can do. 85, 90, 92 percent of all your work just burning fat, and that's a beautiful thing. So now you're, as you're just walking around the day or you're doing, you know, minor tasks and even going to the gym, you're mostly burning fat. Now the brain uh, doesn't burn fat. The brain is using the ketones. So you got the muscles using the fat. The brain's using the ketones. 
Um, you don't need glucose very much at all. A little bit for red blood cells and a few other things, but your body actually makes glucose. It's, it's, again, it's so elegant, Steve. So you got the triglyceride, the, the, the three fatty acids get combusted. Um, the glycerol becomes part of a, a mechanism that makes glucose. Right. It's, it's so elegant, it's almost like a, a closed loop. So um, your liver just goes, oh, I see what you're doing. When you go to the gym and you do all this work, your legs, you might do a leg day, and your legs require 30 times as much energy to go through that work. While you're doing your legs, how much energy does your brain require? Same as usual. Same as usual. So the brain just goes like this all day long.